It's International Women's Day, and tonight we celebrate a special group of powerhouse female equestrians in rare conversation together, sharing with us how they broke barriers in the horse industry from the barn to the boardroom, navigating the Me Too movement, shaping their successful careers into legendary status, and carving a path for the female horse bond to burn brightly into the future. Tonight, we will learn, grow, and be inspired as they take a look at where the equine industry has been and where it's headed. This is the Trailblazing Horsewomen live stream. Good evening. Welcome to Stream Horse TV, where horse enthusiasts can join together to expand their horizons in equine sports and culture. We are so thrilled tonight in partnership with Horse Illustrated to be bringing you this extraordinary group of true role models who will be featured alongside six other women in the upcoming Trailblazing Horse Women article in Horse Illustrated's May issue. Viewers, let us know where you're tuning in from and also send in your questions. We hopefully will get into answering a few viewer questions during the program tonight. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to the original Equinista, L.A. Sokolowski, who wrote the article. And L.A., none of this would be possible without you. So a big thank you your way. Tonight will be so special for sure. And the theme of International Women's Day this year is hashtag choose to challenge. Given our lineup tonight, it seems pretty perfect, right? I would have to agree with you, Natalie. It's a pleasure to be here this evening and to welcome everybody who's along for this ride because choose to challenge yes is the hashtag for the 2021 international women's day and i challenge anybody to find a more impressive lineup of uh, uh, trailblazers and alpha mayors than we've got here uh, you know the uh, the word trailblazing is about leaving the beaten path for a tremendous reward the term refers to the practice of marking paths through uncharted territory with blazes, marks that were made on trees by slashing the bark to indicate direction. Well, the six women with us tonight have all led the way in carving out their place in our horse industry. And as uh, Stephanie Schrock, the president at the political action group Emily's List, had said, it's not easy to be what you've never seen before. And also without mirrors, it's awfully tough to break through glass ceilings. So I'd like to introduce, uh, we have six trailblazers with us tonight who have crushed that glass ceiling. And before we start, I also want to honor one of the wonderful trailblazers who uh, sadly uh, eluded us for a, um, an interview. We lost Jane Savoy, uh, the three-time U.S. national freestyle champion. Uh, she was the 1992 U.S. Olympic dressage reserve rider. Uh, and she was the author of five books in six languages, from Dressage 101 to That Winning Feeling. And she was coached in 96 and 2004 for the Canadian Olympic three-day team. Uh, Jane did learn that she was chosen to be among these trailblazers. So she's with us in spirit. And then without further ado, Please let me introduce the wonderful women that we do have this evening. Debbie Roberts Lukes, the legacy strategist for Monty Roberts and the movement. Patricia E. Kelly, the founder of Ebony Horsewomen Inc. and the EHI Equestrian and Therapeutic Center. Five time Olympian and two time U.S. Olympic show jumping silver medalist, Ann Krasinski. Linda Tellington Jones, the Peace Run Torchbearer, that's a favorite thing I love to say about her, as well as founder of the Tellington T Touch Training, four time AQHA Super Horse Trainer, Lynn Palm, who is celebrating her 50th anniversary in the horse business. I don't know how that happened because I don't think any of us look a day over 29. And last but not least, 
Patty Colbert, the creative marketer and the amazing mastermind behind the Extreme Mustanger, Mustang Makeover, as well as an Equine Industry Vision Award winner. Wow, we have got some great women to bring in. And let's please start with Debbie and with Patricia. Hi, LA. How are Hi, you? LA. Hi there, and thank you so much for being here on International Women's Day. You two are forces of nature. Uh, I'd like to start with uh, Debbie. You know, you are not only a woman, but you are a daughter who has thrived in the uh, household of one of the best names in horse training. And you found a term yes. for it that I don't think anybody has on any business card, legacy strategist. Yeah. I did that as a joke, you know, because anybody who's run a family business knows you wear all the hats and I didn't know what to put. When I started meeting with with people in boardrooms, you know, officially like I thought, well, what do I what do I I asked everybody, what do I, what do I put on my my card? I can't say first daughter or something. you know. <laughs> so so I, I actually did it as a joke. I put legacy strategists there to see if anybody noticed. And, you know, it was about two years before anybody noticed. So, I'm glad you noticed. Well, come on. It, it has to be it has to be an icebreaker of sorts. I thought so, but nobody noticed. <laughs> I guess we don't use cards much anymore. That might be the, the takeaway there. Well, well, I know one person that doesn't often use a business card is God. And Patricia mm -hmm. Kelly, you love to say how God jokes when it came to taking you on this path into the horse world and into establishing since 1984, uh, Ebony Horsewomen. Please tell us, how, how, how did you find your way into the horse world? I, I didn't, I got led in. <laughs> um, and it, I think it really started at birth, although I had no clue what was going on. I was just following a wave um, as I had said to you before, you know, my dad um, was a jockey uh, in the early part of the 19th century, had a horrific accident, never rode again, um, and didn't want me to do it at all. So I never knew about legacy in terms of him having this horse experience. Uh, but I fell into it. I, I had this neighbor that lived next door to me that had a horse and wagon. And this is during the early fifties when um, we moved into this neighborhood that was all white and um, it wasn't pleasant. So he decided to save me with a horse and he did. And I, that just kicked off. I think something that was already embedded in me. And so um, I just rode the way into um, being where I wanted to do this kind of thing. And I always said that God does have jokes because I this was not in my plans. I was going to do a thousand other things. You know, I prepared to do a thousand other things and got degrees and all kinds of things. And I think God was like, that's good. You're going to need that. Go right ahead. You, you're going to use it. Uh, and then when it was time to t make that turn to get me in that correct path that he wanted me to be in, I was in and, and off and running. So I, God has a lot of jokes. You know, the, the, I think who said it when when man plans, God giggles. <laughs> well, he, he was on a full blast laugh with me because I had planned a thousand different other things. Well, and, and part of that was you were in the Marines. Well, yeah, and that, you know, th th those two horses don't really equal out too well. You know, I was <laughs> going to be G.I. Jane, and he was like, okay, that's all right. Go ahead, sweetie, you're going to use that too. So it was it's just amazing, you know, when you look back over your life and you see, you know, the hand, his hand moving and twisting and turning you and opening doors here and closing doors there so that you would eventually wind up doing what he wants you to do, you have to give up and say, okay, I'm yours. Just tell me what next. So <laughs> that, that's what happened. <laughs> well, and, and Debbie, you, of course, you followed in the footsteps and, and developed uh, this connection with the horse and, and 
with throughout the whole entire world. But now your next step, of course, we learned the language of Equus, thanks to your father. But now you want to change that lexicon a little bit from the rescue horse to the transition horse. Yes. I, I'd love I'd love to have you tell us more. Well, we had been working with, we started a school, a nonprofit in the 90s, in 97, and uh, we thought that the best thing we could do is share this, just plant the seeds out there. And we've now been in 41 countries over all these years. I ran dad's tours and, and developed all the um, instructors and, and, and all that system, which was a lot of fun working in so many different foreign countries. But the thing that was funny was when we had the classes here, hit and miss, um, we we were working with these horses and nobody wanted to give us their champion horses to to learn on, <laughs> to have our students play with. <laughs> no guinea pigs here. So uh, it was it was really the sanctuaries and the rescues that helped us fill the classes with horses to use. And turns out it was pretty symbiotic because we could polish up these horses in the classes. Of course, our instructors overseeing everything and then give them back to these um, rescues uh, to to be more adoptable or help them become adopted. And then we got to thinking, now, wait a minute. What if we did that year round? We could go from we could probably explode with horses because the OTTBs coming off the racetrack with all the horses that are people just can't afford them, you know, with all the situations. So we did partner and we created and piloted with the right horse, which is a, a program of the ASPCA. We launched this last year on live streaming TV, just like this. We <laughs> launched the Monty Roberts Mustang and transition horse program. And I had Phil D'Amato here as a trainer off the, the track. And I said, got any horses you want to, you know, uh, pass through one of the, the adoption partners? And they're like, yeah, all the time, you know, all the time. So it's been pretty exciting. And it's not just OTTBs. We've had little appendix paints and we've had saddlebreds and we've had uh, quite a variety. It's a lot of fun. But that's just sort of the three legs of what we do because we, we work with we have work with not only using the transition horse in the courses, but we use them also with our veterans program called Horses and Healing. Mm -hmm. And we also have Lead Up, which is a program for at risk youth, those kids that are either going to go to the boardroom or to the gang and uh, they have to work their way in. And we we really like that, too. So like Pat, which I so admire you, Pat, it, it's really exciting to to feel like I've got you as my inspiration, all these people who have come before us who recognized horses in therapy early, early in the game. Now we're being able to expand on that into areas and the qualities of horses are so amazing for therapy. Not like any dog or cat, frankly, those are carnivores, right? A, yeah. flight, a flight animal is a completely different set of principles. Those qualities of horses amaze me amaze me. That's, that's a really, really great point. And, and, you know, that makes me wonder, Pat, who was the first therapy horse that came into your program and, and how did you find them? Hmm. Okay. So <laughs> all of them were therapy horses. Right. And, you know, the interesting thing about them, um, many of them had their own issues. You know, it wasn't just that some of the kids that we were dealing with had issues. These horses had issues. We had one particular horse who um, had been given up so many times that he developed a, um, an anger about being left. And, mm -hmm. and so as we were using him to help um, a child, he needed help as well. Yeah. So, you know, all of them became therapy horses in their own way. They, all of them had something to give to each individual. And the funny thing about that was that um, unknowingly, most of the people that we help, particularly as we focus on kids, they picked the horse that could help them the most. Isn't that nice? And, yeah. and vice versa. Yeah. It was exactly the kind of person that that horse needed. Love it. Well, with your program too, something uh, really resonated in the description that you call it culturally competent. Right. equine assisted therapy and, and that you pointed out that uh, because some issues require specificity and that trauma crosses 
many intersections. Correct. Can you expound for us and, and, and school us a little bit on, on understanding cultural competency? Okay. So when you're talking about equine-assisted psychotherapy, because equine-assisted therapy could be everything from walking a horse, brushing a horse, you know, the activities. Mm -hmm. When you talk about psychotherapy, you've got the horse, you've got the client, and a horse specialist. And because you are with prey and predator, us being predators and the horse being prey, the horse is gonna is gonna pick up on energy levels, correct? He's right. gonna pick up the energy in the room. And the therapist has to be very careful that it that their own biases does not complicate that matter. So if you're if you're working with um, a guy who just came out of prison and is angry uh, about why he was in there in the first place, uh, the, the life of prison as well, and you place him with a woman, that's one energy difference, and then a woman from a different culture, the energy levels of the biases and the energies from this particular therapist to the client could interrupt, could get in between what we're trying to discern from the horse. So the horse could be acting or responding not from the client, sure, but from the therapist. And those are those biases. So without understanding, and, and most of the time, hopefully, it's an implicit bias, it's mm -hmm. unconscious biases, whether it's the fear from gender to gender or the fear between race. Mm -hmm. So if the if the if the uh, therapist is not culturally competent, she or he would not be aware of their own biases that can complicate the therapy session. And not only does it complicate the therapy session, when she be he or she begins to write their notes on the session, they could be acting out of their own bias. Uh -huh. So it's, it's, it's critically important. So one of the things that I have found with many of the certification agencies that, that do certification for equine assisted psychotherapy, none of them talk about cultural competency. And I think one of the reasons why is that EAP has always be done, been done in the suburbs, in rural areas. It is heretofore Ebony Horsewomen not been done in the urban settings and not done with the demographic of people that we work with. So it, they don't understand cultural competency and it's a great um, hole that they leave in terms of working with people. If they're gonna work with one demographic, fine. But if, if it's gonna be open for all people, you've got to understand cultural competency. I, much much like moving from the word rescue to transition, I, I get the impression right. that cultural competency should be a word that gets folded into our lexicon and mm -hmm. used more as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, 100%. I, I'd like to put one more thing in there and challenge all horse people too, that we're, we're pushing a campaign around hashtag starting not breaking. Starting because, not breaking. Mm -hmm, starting not breaking because there, uh, you know, we have a an event called the Movement that'll be June 18th through 20, and we have that'll be our fourth year. And last year we put it out there that we use that word breaking too much. I don't, you know, I don't like using it for women. <laughs> I don't like using it for horses. I don't even like using it for halters. Halter broke. Uh, but you know, I think I think we could actually do something about that vibe that we give off um, in the future if we just become cognizant and conscious of that too. Don't you think, Pat? Well, it's a predator term. It is exactly. a, a very straight predator term, yeah. you know, control and power instead of partnership. So absolutely, we have to change that. We, we should change that. And, and as we're thinking about uh, addressing those marginalized groups, um, we have to be able to fold more riders who represent that in as well. In fact, uh, I, I was just uh, reading in Time Magazine a brief part about intersectionalism, the idea that all aspects of our, uh, of our identities combine 
to perform a matrix of, of privileges and oppressions. And, and that intersection between the horse and life uh, has been powerfully represented recently by um, one of our own who has stepped to the forefront of another hashtag, the Me Too movement. And at this time, I would like to bring in our two-time silver medalist and wonderful mentor mm -hmm. and voice for <laughs> other riders is Ann Kaczynski. Ann, welcome and thank you. Oh, well, thank you. I'm so um, honored to be here with all these other amazing, powerful, life-changing women. So thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And I'm, I'm honored to be here with all of you. I, I think I think we're tickled that we can uh, have as many conversations uh, as we are with this group, and and you know I want to jump right in marginalization while, while we're thinking about that. Um, I remember you had said that when you're successful, it's inevitable to be seen as a role model, and you hope that you've been a good one. How has uh, how has the Me Too movement? Uh, how did the gymnastics scandal? Uh, how, how did how did that show you that now was the time that was right to tell your own story? And it has it stayed the right time? Yes, absolutely. You know, I've I've had a great career and started riding when I was four. And uh, listening to you gals, the horses were my saviors. The horses were my therapy throughout my growing up. Um, and I, yes, I was abused when I was eleven by a very, very, very famous horseman. Uh, uh, he was godlike, and um, but I held it in for many, many, many years. Uh, it wasn't until I started therapy. I'd already been to an Olympics or maybe even two Olympics, but I, I started into therapy. And through that, um, uh, with a psychotherapist in Philadelphia, and I drive once a week, nobody knew I really was going, you know, nobody in, in, in the horse world really knew. Uh, but until uh, finally I came to this part about talk, sharing it with my sister, starting to share it with people, that was part of therapy to talk about it, you know, get say it out loud to other people. And uh, I'm in my late, I don't know, late twenties or something. And so I share it with my sister. Oh my God, he got hurt too. And of course we never knew. We never knew. We never knew. And that's what made me crazy. Um, I had lived with it. I had dealt with it. Then, then I it was really like, oh my God, I've got to do something about this. So, but this was, or maybe it was early nineties. And my sister has passed a few years ago from cancer, which is too bad, but we all dealt with all of this uh, before the Me Too movement came out. But it was then... Uh, then I shared it with some other people. And so at the time, uh, we came forward, several of us girls from the riding club that this Jimmy Williams had abused. Um, but statute of limitations, we couldn't do anything. You know, we met with the lawyers. We we tried to do everything. We talked, started talking to people about it. And I was already on the East Coast and competing. And as I said, going to the Olympics and and had a, my own career there on the on the East Coast. And and uh, so then it was sort of not time. Okay, we can't really do anything about it. Good, I shared it. That was great for therapy. I even confronted him, and and I did get an apology. I have to say that many that doesn't happen to many people. Uh, it was wild, but anyway, it, I am so thankful for that and with my therapist. And anybody in a little trouble, or I can't recommend therapy enough. Um, but anyway, to have somebody professionals to talk through with this. But again, my horses were my, that's what I love doing. The horses were my savior. And if anything, I dove into that. Whereas I know a lot of them, my sister included, drugs, alcohol, other things they got involved with. And so I'm so thankful that I went on to have a great career. And as you talk about uh, getting to go to the Olympics and do these things that I can share now with younger kids and, and even older gals now that have told me their story that have never told their story before since I've come forward. But anyway, um, so then, okay, I'm okay with it. Lots of therapy, spiritual help. Uh, I mean, I did a, a lot of different things and I was cool with it and forgiveness and all of it. But then a couple of years ago when the Hollywood and these gymnasts all of a sudden talk, started talking about it, and I thought there was this little voice inside of me saying, I got to do something. And so I went to the Federation, the U.S. Equestrian Federation, and Diane Langer, who's the, our, our youth coach, and I said, have anybody in the horse sport been talking about this? Well, then Diane shares her story. It's out public also, but yes, she had been abused somebody by somebody else. Uh, 
so we got together and, and I really said, you know, let's let's do something to save the kids. You know, I, I love my sport. I love the horses. There's nothing I love more than horses and all they've done for me and sitting in the stalls, being a little kid crying or talking about whatever was going on, the abuse, the lots of alcoholism around at the time, all these things that, you know, were hanging around. The horses, thank God for the horses. Oh my God. And as you, you talked about, Pat, what the different ones deal with you with them, you know, uh, the, the, the different, anyway, that's a whole nother thing I could go into, but they were so amazing. They were my therapy. Um, but from that, uh, speaking up now is the perfect time. And, uh, you know, a little pushback from some people in the industry initially. I mean, these are some famous, famous, famous top horsemen that have that have been sort of falling down, you know, being, you know, it's but it's true. And I believe the girls, I believe the boys, there are some boys that have come forward. Uh, that it's got to stop. It just can't happen. And it's the same as abusing the horses. I mean, that that also, I could go in that direction also about, uh, I've been successful, but never at the at the the abuse of a horse or anything. My goodness, no, no, no. And, and again, for me, because they did so much for me. So now is the time, and I'm, I've been quite vocal about it uh, and very supportive of other girls going through it. Um, it's such a wonderful sport and what horses do for girls and boys and growing up and all that they teach us, all that they give us. Uh, and then to have some creep, uh, predator, uh, sex guy, whatever, ruin all of that. And to hear the stories of all the, like I say, I am so thankful. Uh, you know, it's not been easy. We all have our stuff. It's It's been a hard journey. And even coming forward, as I say, that some people, yeah, they don't talk to me at the horse show today. Or if I show a hunter in a hunter class, maybe, you know, maybe the judge doesn't pin me as well. I mean, I have to say some of that. And, and I knew that. And I knew that speaking up. Now, in the jumper ring, it doesn't make much of a difference. And, you know, you go fast and you don't knock them down. And, you know, that doesn't matter. Um, and but. Those are those were choices I made, but now is the time. We've got to stop it. We've got to speak up. We've got to do everything we can to save the kids. Uh, it's um, it's such a great sport, and horses are so amazing. Well, it, it, it's a it's a great sport, and and absolutely, the horses are, are number one. And I know when we had spoken earlier, there was there there was the horses that changed your life and and as they were saying each horse gravitates to the person who needs them who was the first horse that gravitated towards what you needed what was the horse that changed your life you know oh well there there have been a couple later on at the olympics and things but but as a as a young girl you know, probably the first, there was this school horse at the Flint Ridge Riding Club. His name was Sabado, and he was this big liver chestnut with big lips, and he sure wasn't handsome or anything. Later, you know, I got some beautiful, we have beautiful horses and things. But, oh, my God, he, he, you could tell him anything. You could tell him anything. And he would listen, and I could hug him, and he, he you know, he might have been lame. I don't know, I was a little kid, but he, but to me, he was like Pegasus. And he gave me confidence, and I could be be proud of my riding and even even if he wasn't the most expensive horse at the riding club what he gave me the the love and then I could share and he was my buddy uh and not a famous horse or anything um so that that probably you know that is a little kid this funny school horse at the riding club uh was the first one and then and then many many more since then through various times of my career uh do, do you I, have a do you have a sabado in your uh, lesson string now <laughs> I, I do have a, a, a more beautiful, but yes, an off the track thoroughbred also that had raced and uh, won races. And his name is Only One. I named him that because he was a, a thoroughbred, Only One. You don't see so many in the hunter and the jumper ring so much anymore showing. And and uh, and he, same thing. The kids ride him and this, oh, he can be obnoxious too. He's a thoroughbred. He, he, he has a, he'll test the riders, but I love that. But mostly when people the, hug him and smile and love him and you know what horses do uh for children or even now today I'm, i've got several teenagers i'm teaching I, you know mostly i've worked with older people and i uh, you know other other professional snakes well, i've got some 11 and 12 and 14 year old girls and to see them we're in wellington florida now competing down here whether they have a good day or a bad day or this chestnut mare that can stop sometimes but she's teaching the little girl Oh my, in the barn, kissing and hugging, and whether they fell off or the horse stopped, 
that stuff, I, I love that as a, at my age of doing this, to be, see the children and what horses do for them. And, and listening to Pat and Debbie about the therapy, you know, I've always wondered about getting, uh, somehow getting a little bit involved with that. And maybe I'll talk to you, you gals about this afterwards because I know how important it is. Um, so, so, you know, women and horses, it's an amazing chemistry. Uh, it, it is an amazing chemistry. And before we, we move on, uh, Pat and Debbie, we do want to ask you to share a story of the first horse that you fell in love with. Uh, uh, Debbie, why don't you start? Okay. All right. I, I thought about this as I'm watching this scroll below. And uh, it has to be Nyla's doll. My mom had a beautiful mare named Julia's doll. And then this other mare came along and fold and died in the folding process. And my my dad said, Monty said, would you would you like to keep the baby? But it's a huge responsibility because I, I don't believe in bottle fed. And I said, okay. And I'm in second grade. So <laughs> I'm pretty little. And, and he said, you have to goat feed this, this little baby. And I said, okay. And he built a stand and uh, the goat at first, you know, when you put a little grain in there, goats eat everything. Right. And uh, got in there. But after, after a while, goat doesn't want to go up there too much. So I had to sort of wrench the goat up <laughs> every time. <laughs> and then as Nyla got bigger, um, just, you know, how do you not fall in love in second grade with a baby horse? Right. So as she got bigger though, she needed two goats. <laughs> and so I, I raised her up and, and actually was the first one to back her. And um, that, I mean, that's just got to be your first love, right? Uh, yeah. I, what nursing, nursing a foal off a goat is, yeah, that, that's a new one that you definitely win with that. Took me and, a long time to like goat cheese though. I, that's oh, the only problem. <laughs> oh, cliche. Sorry. Uh, how about you? Who's the first horse that, that you fell in love with? So I thought as a young girl, I thought I was in love with Roy Rogers. And it, but it wasn't Roy, it was Trigger. <laughs> and when I realized that it wasn't Roy, I went out to look for Trigger. And this is a, as an adult woman. And I found him beautiful, uh, Palomino, platinum mane and tail, chiseled like a ballerina. Beautiful. The first sign that there was going to be a problem was they were trying to trailer him into me and he put his legs through the back of the trailer. <laughs> oh, <laughs> his legs up. And, you know, God, God loves fools and babies. And I was both. <laughs> and I was like, no, I want him. I want him still. And he was just nervous. Well, we finally got him to the barn and he was not my friend Flicka, he was absolutely, he was like, I could care, I could do without you, don't whistle for me, I'm not going to come over to the fence and hug you, I'm not going to do any of that, and just go away, go away, and I just kept on with him, kept on with him, and he, we called him Rising Star, because this boy would rear, and walk <laughs> you. he would do a dance you up in the air and again being a fool and a baby I was like oh that's so cute and I'm thinking of him, like, you know my mother's screaming he's gonna kill her he's gonna kill her and I'm like ah you just don't understand <laughs> well after a lot of antics that this horse did and I mean I rode him out in the park once and it's, where I am is 693 acres and it was a long ride and I decided to get off him and he was like, well, too bad, uh, Chick, because you can't get back on now. We're going to have to walk home. I'm like, please don't, please don't make me walk home. Please, uh. please, Star, let me get back on. He was like, nope, nope. <laughs> well, I had one of those days. I had a death in the family, and it really rocked me. And this horse became a whole different horse. He would never come to, you, you know, you could whistle, give him grain and he was like, ah. This day he came to me and he laid his head on my shoulder. Oh. And I didn't move because I wasn't really sure if he was laying his head on his, my shoulder to bite me or something, I left it there. And he just laid it there. He knew I was heartbroken. Um, he showed me 
his compassion. He showed me he knew. And I was hiding it. I was actually hiding it from everybody. But he knew. And I I just stood there and he just laid his head there and we stayed there for I don't know how long. And then he finally just lifted his head and he walked off. And when he walked off, he turned back and looked at me as to say, are you okay? Are you okay now? And um, that did it for me. That, that was my rising star. And now the day after that, he was back to, ah, go away. Um, but it was, he knew, he just knew. And so forever, and, and he was such a beautiful horse. He was absolutely trigger. Um, he will always be in my heart. I, he passed in um, 2005. And um, I had to, after struggling for hours to see if we could save him, I had to finally give the vet the go ahead to let him go on to a better pasture. And um, there will never be another star. Well, it's that connection that goes straight to our heart that makes loss hard, yeah. but it makes being with the horse wonderful. And with that thought, I want to introduce a woman who has elevated that relationship with the horse for all of us. Uh, she says, do not call her a guru, so we won't, <laughs> but she is as influential and as uh, incredible uh, a mentor and spiritual leader. So as we say goodbye to uh, Debbie and to Pat, and, and thank you so much for everything, we're going to bring in Linda Tellington Jones because rumor has it that she and Anne have not seen each other in a while. So we could have some fun catching up to do. Hello, ladies. Aloha. Hi. And aloha. It's really a pleasure to be here. And, and it's so good to see you. You look the same as you did the last time I saw you, and it's been at least 15 years. Yes. Well, you look the same also. And I'm so honored to be here with you. And when I heard you were going to be on, that just, I'm so exciting to see you. Well, it's mutual. And before the other two, I know we'll, we'll get them back. I just want to say how uh, deeply I was touched by and uh, the fact that you've come forth and talked about the abuse that you had and the beautiful story that Pat had um, with this horse knowing when she needed him. And, I, and, and, and just, I, I'm, and the work that Debbie is doing, it is such an honor for me to be here. And with you, LA, you could be the star of this show. I mean, when I hear what you have done, it's really amazing. And, and I'm sure this is true for you. I have so many friends who they wouldn't have made it through past teenage if it hadn't been for the horses in their lives. They wouldn't have survived. Yeah. Absolutely. And, yeah. Well, while, the, while you two ladies may insist that you haven't changed in, uh, in, in the years <laughs> in between, which completely botches my segue, because <laughs> what I am going to ask is in the interim, what have you seen that's changed in the horse world? Uh, what what has evolved? What has improved? And Linda, I'll let you jump in and start there. Well, there's so much evolution. I think now, actually, the fact that horses are used for various types of therapy, when I say used, I mean, hmm, been brought into this position of being respected for therapy. That's a whole new thing. And I get a lot of people who come to my courses who have maybe, they've rescued maybe five or six, sometimes even seven horses, give them a beautiful life at home, and they have no interest in riding them. They just want to be there for them. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's really, really interesting, I think. Well, Anne, I, I know that uh, you as well had been advocate early on for uh, protective headgear, <clears throat> TBI protection, uh, I, I'm sure. And around that same time, Linda, you were just introducing 
T-Touch and uh, these uh, uh, these philosophies. Uh, how uh, how has it been to be at the forefront? And was change easy? Uh, did it come incrementally? Uh, Anne, why don't we start with you? Uh, how, how does everybody protect their head now? <laughs> well, way better than it used to be. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I was, yes, I went through a phase in the 80s where I had several concussions and probably started riding too soon. You know, head injuries, they they do a CAT scan, but not nothing like they do today, really. And OK, get and we're all tough. All riders and horsewomen, we're tough. And by God, keep going. And so I had a couple concussions in a row and I really had to take it might have been six months, four to six months off that I really didn't ride. I did what the doctor said. And and and. Hopefully today I feel good and fine and knock on wood, all those things. But at the time, I was one of the very first riders in the States that really started riding with a chin strap, a, a helmet with a chin strap, competing with it. And they weren't very, they were plastic shells. They weren't strong like they are today. I mean, now they're really made much more with the football players. And there's a whole new um, uh, study going out with some universities and with our, our federation, uh, the USEF and um I think the racetrack, anyway, to even get the standard better for head headgear, for helmets and, and that kind of safety stuff. And now even vests, ride, more people riding with uh, safety vests, um, different ones that will go off and expand and, and uh, if you fall off, things like that. So that part of the sport really has changed. And again, and that was another one in the beginning, people poo-pooed the chin strap. Oh no, and it looks funny and this and that. Well, today everybody wears it and most most people would never get on a horse without one. They they think that's that's dumb. So, uh, so that was, you know, yeah, that was in the 80, 83, 84, I think, uh, that that was going through. Well, and Anne, congratulations, because that has been huge. And we just had this discussion uh, at the stable I go to um, last week, is that if you have a, a helmet that is not one of the new ones, yes. go out and invest in a new one. Because one of the things that's changed, I think, is the fact that there are so many accidents in the horse world now, way, way more than I remember yeah. 40 years ago. Yeah. And I think because people don't have as much time, aside from COVID, of course, but they don't have as much time, the horses don't have as much space. And um, and so we, I love the idea of these inflatable vests. I think anybody who rides without them is not taking care of themselves like they could. So I didn't realize you'd started that, boy. Congratulations. Yeah, oh, I, yeah, save your back. <laughs> <laughs> all of that getting going, you know, just to be, yeah. the, again, stay current. And as you say, there are accidents and more uh, people are riding. It's amazing. I love that. I mean, there are more horses at the horse shows and more people. Again, maybe they don't have enough time, all those things. They need to keep working on improving it. But then let's be as safe as we can. Well, and when I grew up, which is a long time ago, because I'm 83, when I, at our riding stable, it was said that, um, until you've fallen off or been bucked off or stomped on 99 times, you can't <laughs> consider yourself a rider. And that has really changed. Yeah. And that's changed thanks to the groundbreaking work of Sally Swift yes. and uh, what Peggy Cummings is doing, this idea of riding with awareness. And that's, that's really, um, I think it's been a huge, huge gift to the horse world. Absolutely. And even in show jumping and things, you know, now the equipment is lighter, the rails are lighter, the, they have breakaway cups now, you know, if you hit the jump, they fall down more easily than they used to. Um, there are also things like that in, in our sport that that uh, ha have made for safer riding as yeah. well. Also footing, yeah. you know, really now the footing that we jump on, the big shows, they've improved it and they're constantly improving and working it for the safety of the horses and less slipping or less falling. So so safety is a huge part of our sport with horses. Yeah. And one of the things that came up in the last discussion, I think if I can, uh, this idea um, actually that uh, Debbie brought up and that is of talking about training rather than breaking and we actually like to think of educating even and i i really support debbie in that going for training instead of breaking because breaking the spirit that was you know considered you had to do it 
And um, I'm well, just well, so please please expound on that yes, because yes. we've gone from we've evolved from breaking riders. <laughs> you, know, really, you fall 99 times. Well, you're broken. You're not you're not experienced. To we don't like to use the term breaking horses as well. And 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 please expound on on how T touch and your approach has has elevated how we work with horses and how particularly as women, well, let's face it, we're never going to be able to use brawn or or out muscle a horse. I, I remember talking with Margie Goldstein Engel, where was she was Goldstein before Engel, but you know she was never going to be able to uh, out muscle a, a horse five times her her size or weight. So that we learn negotiation and and cooperation. And Linda, you your lessons have really helped us learn how to cooperate with horses. I, how how did that start? Where are we now? What can we take away tonight about that? Well, I was really blessed when I I, I had to ride to school for the first six years of my life in the, from the first grade. And when I was nine, we moved an hour, a mile and a half away at our farm, away from a big riding stable. And I was, because I'd ridden all those years, you know, just bareback, I could get a, sit on anything, never had a lesson before. When I started riding at this stable, the riding instructor who was really a ex- wonderful, brilliant uh, woman um, would buck the horses out in the very small round pen and then attach that horse to her horse. And I'd be the kid who would put on and we go out in the big arena, walk, trot, and canter. I say that I'm shorter than my sister Robin Hood because I've been dumped on my head so many times, you know, shortened my life. But then when I was 12, I was riding home from the stable and um, and an old man walked out on, on a cane with a cane with a book in his hand and said he'd seen me over his back fence, you know, riding all these horses, rain or snow, because we had no arenas indoors. And um, and so he gave me this book, and it was a book written by an American cavalry officer on how you start a young horse without trauma, without bucking. And when I was 12, we had a two and a half year old, 16 hand thoroughbred mare boarding at our farm, and I started her with no problem. And so I had done that for years. We did that in our school. And then, um, you know, I was really blessed that um, my grandfather, Will Cave, that's a whole other story. When he was 80, came to our thoroughbred farm in Hemet, and he brought us a form of massage that he, as an American trainer in Russia in 1905, had learned from a Russian gypsy. And so we started using this form of massage to help our horses recover after hard endurance riding and 3D eventing and showing, which we did a lot of. But then in 1975, I entered a four-year training with Dr. Moshe Feldenkrais at the Humanistic Psychology Institute, um, thinking I was use, going to use this wonderful Feldenkrais work for my riding students, never realizing you all that it would change my life. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it definitely changed me. And so um, in the second day in this training, Dr. Moshe Feldenkrais made a statement about humans that changed my life with horses. And at that point, I'd had a, I'd had a, for 10 years, a nine month residential school for riding instructors and trainers, in nine countries, 36 states. You know, we invented endurance road, did all this stuff. Never crossed my mind that you could actually teach a horse to learn how to learn without constant repetition, without trauma, without being a predator prey thing. No, you know, a whole different way of being. And he made the, Moshe Feldenkrais made the statement that it's possible for a human to learn in one experience using gentle non-habitual movements that activate new neural pathways to the brain that make more brain cells available for learning. Because that was his passion. And I was lying on the floor in San Francisco that doing this awareness through movement and my ears, I felt like my ears pricked up like a horse. And I thought, whoa. If that's true for a human, it's got to be true for a horse that we could find ways of moving horses gently in ways that would activate new neural pathways to the brain and enhance learning. One of the things I didn't say at that point, we'd already written a book called uh, Physical Therapy for the Athletic Horse in 1965, using this to improve performance, but not personality. And so 
that was the start. And I started looking at horses, moving them, doing the ears, the tail, all this stuff that we did with a whole different way. And you see, because of my family and the background that we have, um, I've always had this ability to have a special relationship with the horse. But with this one and a quarter T-touch, which I, the whole other story, how I got that uh, working on a horse at the Delaware Equine Veterinary Clinic in 1983 after my Feldenkrais training. When you move the tissue in one and a quarter circles, what happens, you connect with this horse at a cell to cell level, at a heart to heart level, at a soul to soul level. And so that it makes those moments like Pat had, you can get those anytime when you start working. And, and do you remember, I can't remember where we were. You had a horse that used to really flip out after the first jumping class, right? Would come yes. out and not eat. I, I was get trying to, I do you remember that? Yes, 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 I do. Shared. Absolutely. And, and, and I remember. How, how did that go? Yeah, and and we, I think, I don't know if it was we did maybe Devon and Toronto. Uh, you, we were a couple of. I was at a couple of shows that you ended up being at. And this horse could be wild. He was a warm blood, but he was like a thoroughbred. I mean, he could be really wild. And, I, you know, I was okay hanging on and whatever. But but <laughs> if we could somehow change that. And Linda came and worked on him. And he was like putty. He got like like he was tranquilized. And it was just her hands. I mean, it was amazing. And then she would then she had me work on him a bit. And I and I used your therapy some but i'm so great to to see you and, and you know get back into it that like this yeah. um and and if told people sold your book i mean told people about your book for years and years your books and and um but in in even then in toronto you had been there early and i was working with him later in the week also and when linda would walk up the horse would just start yawning he would just see her and start <laughs> yawning he didn't even she didn't even have to touch him then eventually but i could kind of do it then by the end of the show and and doing her her tea touch and along with he like i say he was so much more relaxed and happier and and our relationship the rapport was totally different um, i mean he came to me like that and then to see what linda could do and change that was really and that was i, I want to say late 80s maybe early 90s i, I mean it was long late 80s i'm late pretty 80s. sure and and to yeah. see this and to see the horse change you know there's you know it's the horse all but yeah i know the horse and totally different it was amazing it was miraculous really and 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 then even you know you say them on a on this the neuro change in the neural pathways well now everybody's talking about that now it's sort of it's a it's a i mean i know you know must know about it like everybody's talking about it um neuroplasticity and this and that but you were talking about it way back when and the horse not even people that are like making it up the horse you know can't talk that fascinating fascinating work exactly and that's the interesting thing when uh, i gave a presentation at uh, amherst college on 81 for dr moshe feldenkrais and I, I was there assisting then after i had graduated assisting with this class and um I gave a presentation and what was so interesting is that you could see the horse change like right in front of your eyes. Yes. I mean, that's the yes. thing that's so really incredible about it, you know, and he talked about neuroplasticity in the fifties. Oh my gosh. Wow. I mean, yeah, it was a brilliant, brilliant man. I'm so grateful to have had that time with him and with you. And so I remember, do you remember when I came to White Fences and you had, I think it was a mare who didn't have a very good bascule and yes. we took the bridle off and you jumped her with just the Liberty ring. Yes. And it was like beautiful, right? <laughs> yes, absolutely. And I still have that ring in my tech trunk. I, I have, I have one in my tech trunk and every now and then I will pull it out. But yes, I do remember that. And, and, and again, showing people that amazing, how it totally, and trusting the horse and le letting the horse be a horse. And again, not yeah. breaking, not over controlling all of those things. Yeah, now, so Anna, and, and, wait, I have to ask Anna a quick question. Was that yeah. a wooden ring that, or a rope ring? Uh, a rope, but I have a rope ring now. Oh, good. Oh, yeah, good. yeah, a rope ring. <laughs> because we originally could only get hula hoops. Yes. Oh my God, <laughs> some people still have those. Oh no. <laughs> no, a rope, it's a rope ring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, good. <laughs> Sorry, and, Ellen. Now, Anne, were, were you riding? Could you, could you feel the difference in the bascule? Oh, absolutely. The way the horse uses herself, used herself was totally different. And and then and then feeling, you know, I always love that about Linda. It's not only you 
talking to the horse or you feeling the horse, it's the horse feeling you back and trying to teach riders that today to feel the horse, to really get inside of the horse and feel not only mentally, but physically, you know, all of that. Um, and you, working with you really took me to another level of that. And I'm always be so thankful that it, it's a deeper, a feeling, a deeper, I don't know how you say it, you know. Uh, the thing that is so exciting, I mean, what you asked what's changed, Anne, in, uh, Ellie, in the meantime, I mean, I have learned so much because, oh my God, you know, when in the 80s, when I would talk about what are you doing, releasing fear at the cellular level, oh my God, I wanted to stick the fork <laughs> in my mouth when I said that because it was just too, totally intuitive. And then it was proven at NIH that we actually, we hold emotions in our body and it's through the chemical connections, we think it's in our head. And when we, what we discovered, when we use this one and a quarter basic circles, we can release fear and pain. <laughs> Yeah. And that is the beautiful thing about it. And I finally discovered after all these years of teaching, wait a minute, this one and a quarter circles is actually that golden ratio, that spiral that's in all of nature. And it's in our DNA. So we can actually affect ourselves. And so, Anne, you, I, I want to invite you and in LA into one of my classes because I do these Tuesdays live with Linda where you learn for self-care. Great to touch on yourselves and then you know what your horses are feeling. And it's like a ho the horses have given us that gift. That's how I feel. Great, I'll so, be there. Uh, Tell me when I'll be there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> online, it's all online Great. now. That's the cool thing. <laughs> good, good. We, we, will, we will keep that, that love moving right along because I've, I've seen Linda work with the horses and take the bridle off and and change that bascule. I've seen it visually, but hearing you and describe it, because you, you do, you see the whole top line transform. I, I imagine that, that the whole feeling of the horse underneath yeah. you, uh, and as well as the animal going, hey, you're, you're recognizing me yes. too. Horses, horses start to smile. Yes. That's the thing. You, we, and I will actually, I, I would love to know if Debbie has done that. Well, either uh, one of them, who, because who, who did the, if they do, still do riding with the, with their riders, because with therapy horses, if you take the bridles off and ride them without a bridle between the work that they're doing, it's so different. You know, there's a trust that, that develops that's really special. And I think what I love, because I know, Ellie, you're, and and two, I, I think you're interested in much more than, you know, what's what's happening to us in the world and this trust. When we can develop that trust between ourselves and our horses and the trust in the horses, we're putting that out into the universe. And and we're putting that out to this universe here because we still have two more wonderful trailblazers. <laughs> Let's hear them. <laughs> One, of course, is well known. Uh, her, uh, her reputation precedes her as the trainer of Rugged Lark and three other great super horses, Lynn Palm, also good with the bridalist work. So we're going I to saw that. Lots, of, <laughs> lots of lots of that, uh, as well as last but certainly not least is Patty Colbert, because uh, during her tenure with the Mustang Heritage Foundation, she created, of course, the uh, Extreme Mustang Makeover and seven thousand wild horses got homes because of her incredible work so we're going to bring you ladies in and we're going to put you back in the barn for later and <laughs> okay. horsing around thank you. thank you hello there ladies welcome and thank you for being here I, I, lynn i wanted to jump right in because right now we're talking about throwing away the bridle and connecting with the horse and mm -hmm. you know i still have in fact i have to confess i'll reach behind me i still have my rugged lark that you signed for me in 1996. so everybody remembers that magical connection you had. So could you start a little bit about developing that trust with a horse, that connection, and, and how, how, do you, how do you take it to the point where you don't even need a bridle uh, to be able to ride? Lynn, hit the mute. <laughs> you have to unmute. Sorry. I'm not very techy, but I wanna first say thank you very much for having me be a part of this. I'm very honored and, and uh, 
humbled in every way, and um, it's it's a real treat. Uh, but for me, uh, the bridalist, what a uh, wonderful connection because I have a funny story that I think is funny, but oh, look at this. Um, <laughs> uh, my mentor, the lady that I learned to ride from, I, I'm blessed to have mentors, and I know all, all of these ladies have had mentors, but um, she um, gave me a goal. She said, um, how would you like to learn to ride without a bridle? And I was uh, in my young teens, uh, just starting to ride with her. And um, she says, well, if you can go all around the arena, uh, walk, trot, and canter, um, uh, and take your leads properly. And if you do this um, without holding on to your reins, I will teach you to ride without a bridle. Well, little did I know she was teaching me to keep my balance through my seat and use my seat and my legs as my main communicate factor with the horse. And so anyway, I'll never forget the day when she says, okay, you're doing this well enough. I'm gonna show you how to do it. Well, yes, we did it, had a neck rope uh, cause you do need to control a little bit of the front end of the horse. And it was amazing. And I did it with so many horses thereafter. What it proved to me is that <clears throat> It would always tell on me when I rode stronger with my hands and I shouldn't been because when you go without the bridle, the horse does better. And so building that trust between, I didn't have had no idea as a kid I was building trust, but as a, a professional and throughout my career, yes, doing it with horses builds a tremendous trust, but it also makes the right emphasis in riding is that we ride back to front. So the seat and leg should be the main a communication factor and the guidance of the hands. So that's what it really taught me. And, and it's amazing how much better the horses do without a bridle than with a bridle. So it all works in a great way. Linda, have you ever had a, a chance to, uh, to see Lynn's, uh, Lynn's riding? Have, have your bridle pads ever crossed before? No, I'm so sorry, but you know, I I started teaching in Europe in the 80s, and I've hardly done anything since I saw Anne. I I only do here and there a clinic in the U.S., so I've really missed you, Lynn, and I I'm sorry. <laughs> well, that's you know, I've I've seen you at a couple horse expos, and I never got the chance to meet you, but I've always admired your work and always will, because uh, <laughs> as we're all here together, the magical horse is what brings us together in in our careers and and being a part of so many different kinds of people and and, and wonderful people that are connected with horses. And, and I think it's women that, again. We we can't we can't break the horse. We can't out muscle them. So we learn how to navigate and negotiate. Uh, and then Patty, I have to bring you in because there's nobody else that I can say moms, bombs, and mustangs in the same <laughs> sentence together. You you have you have changed you have changed life and and opportunities for wild horses. Yes. But your own start. Your mom at 15 went to work on the atom bomb in Tennessee. What kind of a, wow, that's a heck of a role model to start with. Uh, I, did, did she ignite your own uh, ability to be creative and move forward in this industry? Well, I think like so many of us, we have such strong female influences in our families, be it mothers, grandmothers, aunts that um, are leaders. And you know, in the horse industry, it's been proven that the majority of horse connections come through friends and families and largely female to female. Uh, it happens that way. Um, but my mom was, a, she was a barracuda. She uh, had to leave home at an early age because of some of the situations that we've discussed today. And um, she, she took her younger sister and they went to the Manhattan Project there in Tennessee, where uh, thousands of young women came and worked on splitting the atom and unfortunately were exposed uh, to a lot of radiation, which she succumbed to later on in her life. But she fought it. But she always had the reins in her hands. I mean, she was always responsible uh, for making decisions and wasn't afraid uh, for change. And um, I think that's a lot where I learned that, but also being around women like we are tonight 
it's just overwhelming um, that we can take parts and pieces from everyone. Linda, while you were talking, I mean, I'm doing circles on my hand, you know, and I'm feeling yes. better already while, <laughs> while I'm listening to you. And, and gosh, the stories we've shared tonight are just so touching, but yet motivating uh, to, mm -hmm. to women that are, that are in love and passionate about horses. You, you've got a group of passionate women here, LA, and we can light a lot of fires, you know, when we want to. <laughs> yeah. Well, Patty, you, of course, have, have said that you've delighted coming up with creative, freaking crazy ideas that blow the walls off for everybody. How did you find the inspiration for the Extreme Mustang Makeover? I steal everything. I mean, I steal, I steal it all. I'm a, I'm a horse thief, you know. I mean, I, I like pop culture. I like listening to, I mean, I've got four pages of ideas just from listening to these broads tonight. I mean, <laughs> it's amazing. And so, so what I, back then it was 2006, I think it was, uh, the Extreme Home Makeover program mm -hmm. was very popular. And it's where they took a story of a family that had a home that was, debilitated for some reason, wasn't worth anything, but a great story brought professionals in for a short amount of time and changed lives. And so I've talked with Lenny about this. Lynn Palm and I have been hooked up for a long time um, mm -hmm. that that, what, you know, typically a trainer will not take a horse for less than 90 days. I mean, you know, just kind of whatever their business is. So I thought if I could get um, experienced people to pick up a wild horse, keep it for a hundred days and then bring it to a contest to show its ability. Um, it would get adopted because as we've discussed in this, what the rescue world, which is now moving into the rehoming and uh, repositioning of horses have learned with training, you have about a 50 to a hundred percent larger chance of getting that horse moved into a new home. Mm -hmm. So everybody thought I was nuts. I was I had worked for the American Quarter Horse Association for a long time. They thought I went off the reservation. Um, and so uh, we came up with this. We wanted to do 100 horses in 100 days and then bring them to Fort Worth to do that. And it it was it was amazing. I mean, Magic. what we don't I think in the industry realize is the amount of intelligent and passionate and tender individuals that know a lot about owning horses and having horses and they just don't want to compete that's that's not what they want to do that is not their arena in life and but but with the incentive and the platform that we gave them Holy smokes, it, it just was the most amazing experience and then has come on because it's entertaining, too. I, um, I'll tell you one short story of the first one oh, is we had it in the um, in the in the um, Watt Arena, which seats a thousand people. And that was the smallest arena at the Will Rogers facilities in Fort Worth. And so. We had of the hundred horses, we had about 80 horses show up, which is huge to only have an attrition of, you know, 20 head was unbelievable. So we're all doing this and the first day starts and I'm running back and forth from one from the announcer's booth to the office on two ends. And, you know, at a horse show, not very many people come. I mean, the trainer comes, the exhibitor comes. Maybe the exhibitor's mom or dad or boyfriend comes, but you know, th there's nobody in the stands for the first day of the deal. And I remember running Pat from one end to the other going, who the hell are all those people? You know <laughs> what? There must be a dog show or something going on. What are these people doing in here? You know, and lo and behold, they just wanted to, to see the wild horses. And they wanted to talk to the trainers with the wild horses. They wanted to 
engage with the wild horses. They had that thing in their mind of these wild horses. So we were fortunate to use that story to have amazing individuals like Lynn and other professionals come and, and judge and help and share um, and use Linda. People referred to your books and your online presence. The whole mm -hmm. online learning situation now is beyond what we even understand. I mean, yeah. it, it's beyond. So we were at the right place at the right time. And just like mm -hmm. Pat said, God can get in there and kind of make things happen. Uh, if you keep your eyes and your heart open and you respect the horse and you respect one another, mm -hmm. it isn't, it isn't your discipline. It isn't your breed. It isn't, it isn't any of that. It's respecting one another's love for the animal. And uh, I was just blessed to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's that's beautifully said, which, which is also a great way for me to respectfully say that we're moving Linda back uh, now for a little bit while we expound a little more on uh, on competition and horses. And we won't have her gone for long because, Lynn, I, I want to make sure that we have lots of time. Yes, we've brought Mustangs into competition and showing people what they can do. But now it just tickles me to death to imagine that we're getting American Quarter Horses at three-day events with the U.S. Eventing Association. And you're at the forefront of uh, helping those registered horses earn points in three day. That's pretty cool. Tell us more. Well, it's uh, something that I've been involved with in the American Quarter Association and being on the show and contest committee, which is all about rules and regulations. And um, I'm on the English committee, English and dressage committee. And from that, um, uh, it's been wonderful. I mean, I've done it for many, many years. I remember starting being a part of starting the whole English division, which was fabulous and work with dynamic people. And, and Don Burton was one of them who was a, a great mentor in a lot of ways in the association in itself. And um, basically um, um, it was, it's been on the agenda two other times, 2016 and 17. It was brought to the table by um, uh, people from USEA and um, to try to recognize uh, quarter horses in the approved USEA competitions. And their AQHA is doing that with um, quarter horses that compete in USDF dressage. And that, I got that accomplished about 15 years ago now. Well, the fun story to this is that AQHA finally um, is more and more adopting dressage and they had it at the AQHA World Show this last year, both for the English horse and Western horse. And so I went there to be a part of it because I've been such an advocator to get this discipline in the breed for all the right reasons and good riding and wellness of the horses. And I met a girl there that was at the World Show with her quarter horse to show an amateur jumping. And she also was in the dressage. And I got to visit with her and she does three day eventing and it clicked to me. And I said, three day eventing, we got to recognize American quarter horses that's showing in those approved uh, three day events, uh, eventing. And uh, so that's on the agenda. I hope to bring it more to the table. I don't know. It's, it's the English events is kind of hard to get around that cowboy hat a lot of times, but um I don't give up. That's the best part of it. So it took me 13 years for them to adopt. <laughs> no, you lot. don't. No, I know. And I, because I learned that from you, Patty, you never give up. But anyway, that's what that's all about. So it was approved by the committee, but it didn't go to the next stage, which was the executive committee. And they turned it down because I don't know why. So I'm going to learn about it all. I mean, I think, you know, it's the numbers game. It's the corporate world and all of that. There's a lot that plays with that. But um, we really need to because the, the quarter horse is um, such an amazing uh, athlete, but also a docile horse to where he really is amateur friendly. He's great with kids. And, you know, the three-day eventing is, is an amazing sport. Uh, you know, those people really, and they're very passionate with their horses, and they need to be, especially when they go on those cross-country courses. So that's the mission on that. 
I, I, I have to confess, I clinicked with Eric Horgan years back with a quarter horse that was decidedly built classically downhill. Mm -hmm. and, and the fences class, all I can remember is Eric going, lift, lift, lift. Mm -hmm. And so he's so much lifting I, I could do. But I would imagine, do we, now, oh, would we be going prelim, uh, a four star? Uh, is, yeah. is there a, a goal uh, in mind? It would be for all levels that they would recognize quarter horses. And yes, you're right. They're a horse that, uh, that's why I love the influence of the thoroughbred in the breed, that they're not as built uphill as other breeds. And yes, it is something you have to develop with those horses. I know that from the dressage, that you're always developing an uphill balance with them. And they need that for the jumping and the dressage as well. Now, actually, both May of I you have the pleasure of working with what I like to call a, a truly made in America horse. Uh, so, you know, uh, Patty, is is the is the Mustang demonstrating as much versatility? Are we seeing them in in three day uh, as well? And what can what can the greater group of equestrians do to uh, help both of you in driving uh, driving ownership and interest in in the breed and expanding its disciplines? What what can we do for you? Let Let's start with Patty. Well, I think just being open to quality, you know, I mean, that that's the thing. But I want to really dial all the way back to what Pat was saying. I think all of this has to do with cultural competence. Um, I think what we're dealing with in the industry right now, which is what I believe that 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 Lynn was facing with the American Quarter Horse Association is our associations are antiquated. Uh, yes. They're cumbersome. They don't mm -hmm. make nimble decisions. They're mm -hmm. weighed down by um, internal politics of, yes. um, that, are, that are tied to competition. And, and the public isn't tolerating that any longer. Um, mm -hmm. you, you have to be innovative. You have to be able to implement things that are popular uh, mm -hmm. with the equine industry, not industry, but with it, newcomers. Newcomers Absolutely. are bringing yes. new things. And if, if we can't change our board of directors, and our methodology in making changes in our industry across the board, breed, discipline, whatever, we're going to stagnate. People mm -hmm. want to be involved with horses. The growth is insane during COVID. You know, this year, this past year, this COVID year could be one of the best years of growth in the horse industry. Mm -hmm. And yet Lynn brings an opportunity like that to the American Quarter Horse. And I'm going to get in a lot of trouble right now. But I'll right now, I mean, MPS is what they're suffering from, which is male, pale, and stale. And, <laughs> and they've, got to, they've got to wake up to our cultural opportunities within the horse. The horse brings us together, I mean, Absolutely. like nothing else, from the city Absolutely. to the countries. And if we don't open our hearts and our minds to that, you know, the, the, they'll run off without us. <laughs> the, yes. the people that love the horses will create their own venues and their own ways to do th things. Yes. And the long old time deals will be left in the dirt and I'll be quiet now. So I don't get us in any more trouble. But uh, cultural is competence is my two new words this year. There you go. They, they are great words indeed, Patty, and, and I would have to agree with you. And, you know, this is how, especially on an International Women's Day, we can talk about evolution and, and change. And, and Lynn, if we want to help you out, uh, do we inspire more grassroots membership? Uh, how, can, how can we help drive getting the quarter horse? in more, especially English disciplines? Well, I think that, again, I have to totally agree with Patty in the fact that it, it comes from the, the leadership and, and having and looking in, vi in vision, being visionaries, you know, and look into the future and, and work toward the future. And absolutely, um, the grassroots people, the youth, I mean, they're the backbone of, of keep growing the industry. But if you bring in people that are all involved with the same breed and they're doing other disciplines where they don't even recognize them, 
I mean, shame on them. It, it's, it's, it's terrible. I mean, why not? It's, and that if, if, if they recognize them in, in three day eventing, it may grow their membership They grow their re registry, their transfers, all of the above. But it, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, I always look in the future. I, I love that. I, I think of that. That's why, and the dressage was a, a something that was, is where I grew up in the dressage saddle, but to bring that into a stock horse breed, I only did it because of the wellness of the horse. Mm -hmm. I saw, I still see way too much bad riding, bad training. Uh, as the other said, we cannot use breaking horses and teach them to submit to perform. That's the total opposite that I've always been my whole life growing up with the horses. How could I hurt this horse to get him to do something that made no sense to me? But I can certainly say that my, my mission is the wellness of the horses. And, and, you know, and as Patty said, I'm attracted to people that they love horses and because that's how I am. And that that's what's most important. And yeah, as everybody I found today, and just may I say, everybody here today, all these dynamic women, what is it? We all have a passion for the horse. They're magical for me in so many ways. And, and people, and as COVID, as Patty said, COVID's been the best thing for people to get involved with animals. And horses have been one. Our business is not hurt at all because of COVID, because we're outside and people can come ride and so that's the best part of it. Yeah, and that's exactly why I was going to ask you, because in doing the interviews for the upcoming article in Horse Illustrated, I, I asked all of you uh, what uh, the year of pandemic, what 2020 uh, did impacted you for, did, did to you, uh, did not do to you. And really, most of the replies have been that it was a good thing. It was a good thing both for the horse industry and it was a good thing to learn a little bit of stillness yeah. and, well, and to reassess. But have, have you seen have you seen a growth in, in horse involvement, Lynn, as well? Well, I think the thing that I um, probably have felt myself first, the only thing that's um, been hard for me is I love to travel and I've stayed home. But I've also loved to stay home because of staying home. But the best part is, is that I think not only myself, but when I've talked to other professionals, is that being home, people have taken more time with their horses, spent more time with their horses. And that's an area where today that everything's hurry up and go fast and skip all the fundamentals for whatever reasons. And of course, the horse is the one that suffers from that. And so I think that's been real positive. But the other thing is that I've seen people it, with horses has kept them out of the stress world. You know, the world's stressed. People are stressed. And horses have taken that away from them. They can come. They could ride. They, or they, they're riding. They're being with their horses for whatever reason. But they're making them smile and, and keep that stress level down. So that's the best thing I've seen from it all. I, I think that's a that's a great connection. The the horse is still the the greatest possible gift that we have. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to stress, we actually have coming up. We're going to be bringing Linda Tellington Jones back because she's going to share a gift of the heart and from the horse that she's going to show with all of us. And, and we're going to be bringing all of these wonderful trailblazers back on for a lesson in doing this, this heart connection. Because uh, the horse is really what ties all of us uh, together. If there is an interconnectivity, uh, whatever our differences are, we all love the same animal and it loves us back. And what more could we ask for than that? So I see that we've got everyone back and Linda with that gift of the horse. I want to have you guide us in the wonderful stress relieving exercise that you showed us the other day. Yes, and it's my pleasure to do so. And what Lynn, you mentioned the stress that so many people have been under in our lives before COVID actually, I think more before 
And the the I, I consider this a gift from the horses. Most of you have heard about this basic moving the tissue in one circle and a quarter as part of the whole Tellington method. It's only a part. But what we've discovered you can do before you go to your horse or just before you get on or when you're feeling that mm, little bit of stress that's coming with you, you can reduce your stress very simply with what we call a T-touch heart hug. And it's quite simple. It has a few steps. First of all, you imagine the face of a clock. I'm sure you all remember those school clocks that we had in our school, the clock on the wall. And we take that imaginary clock off the well and we put it right here in the center of our chest, which is actually our heart chakra. And it's right in the middle of the chest. Now, the reason that we take that clock, we put these imaginary numbers. And the imaginary numbers, you put your six toward the ground, nine to the word the right shoulder, 12 to the word the chin, and three to the left shoulder. Now, why do I do that? Because as soon as you bring numbers in to your awareness, when you are stressed or when you have these looping thoughts or you're feeling a little agitated, ah, the numbers activate our left brain. And that's our logical, wait a minute, I'm safe, I'm here. Now, you imagine the face of the clock and with that imagining, we're going to activate our right brain. And the right brain, we need to be human because the right being is responsible for our feeling. And you know how a tendency when we have too much going on, shutting down those feelings has really been happened to a lot of people. You trust those feelings. It activates the right brain, our creativity, our compassion. And we all need that compassion for all that is on the planet going on. And this intuition, this connection to the divine spirit. And so we imagine that clock, we put one hand over the other and just follow me here. And whatever is comfortable for you, some of you might want to fold the hand back and just put one over the other, or you want to just cup your hand. And now imagine very gently, very gently moving this tissue from six around the face of the clock. And I'm going to go to the right, but if anyone wants to go left, perfectly good whatever you want. We're going to go six, very gently, very gently, six, nine, 12, three, six, nine. Take a big you know, breath at the imaginary nine and smile and give thanks to somebody, someplace in nature, flower, tree, a horse, an animal, a person. Give thanks. Gratitude. Now, just move a little tiny bit and let's do it again and check to see if you prefer the other direction because some people prefer to go left and some right. My preference today is right. So move the tissue gently, one and a quarter. Take a deep breath in through your nose and just out through gently pursed lips. And smile. And think of that something for which you are very grateful. And what we've discovered with studies, brainwave studies that we've done, or with the heart map, M wave, that you can measure your heart coherence. What happens? It puts you in that state instead of these looping thoughts that you can't stop. It takes you away from the part of the brain that controls our emotions and it activates our forebrain. So we have choices. Now, the cool thing is that when we smile, that, as we do this, that activates the serotonin, which is the feel-good hormone. And I, I forgot to share with you, I wanted to say, my mother used to sit on the edge of the arena in these big nine-day horse shows that we had in Edmonton and Calgary. And she'd say, every time I came around, smile, dear. And I'm sure that's why I won more than my fair share. She didn't know we're activating our feel-good hormone, our serotonin. And when you think of something for which you're grateful, gratitude overrides fear. And when we're grateful, we just send this one more tea touch and send it in to these hundred trillion cells that communicate with each other, that make up this container for our soul. It's amazing and connects to the source of all it is. And so going inside like this before you get on your horse or 
just whenever you're feeling a little bit uh, stressed or out of it. And I give thanks always to the horses who brought me to this because I wouldn't be doing this for humans if it, the horses hadn't brought me here. And so I just, I really, it's such an honor to be here with all of you trailblazers. And thank you for bringing us together, LA. The, the, the gratitude, the gratitude is all ours to be able on something as important as International Women's mm. Day to bring so much good, strong feminine energy together and to do it with gratitude and, and positivity. I'm grateful as well to Stream Horse TV and Horse Illustrated magazine for their keen sense of cooperation. This was a brand new venture for them as well to bring all of you wonderful women together and to, uh, to celebrate you as the mentors and indeed as the trailblazers you are. It's hard to be something when you don't have uh, an example to follow ahead of you. So by your being mirrors, you indeed help all of us to break glass ceilings. So thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I just want to add as well that we can continue this conversation. There are six other incredible women that are part of the article that will be appearing in the May issue of Horse Illustrated magazine. So be sure to pick that up because there's a lot of wonderful wisdom also being shared by those women. Catch the replay of this show on Stream Horse TV. And a last suggestion, if you would like to continue to appreciate uh, the history of women and horses, I would like to recommend the Women in Racing exhibit now through the end of the year at the National Museum of Racing and Hall of Fame in Saratoga Springs, New York. I was there uh, before the lockdown. It's an incredible, incredible exhibit. And thank you to the museum that they have responded to these odd times we live in and they're keeping the exhibit going through the end of the year. So happy trails and thank you everyone. Uh, keep breathing and keep smiling. <laughs>